Okay, we'll be beginning now. Uh, am I audible? Thank you, Manu. Jai Bhim, Jai Savitri, Hul Johar and Satrangi Salam to you all. A very warm welcome to our fifth and the last lecture of the Anti-Caste Histories and Solidarities lecture series. In fact, in every sense of the word, this is um, a beginning or rather a continuation of the reflexive dialogue we've envisioned in and for this anti-caste activist and intellectual space. The high number of registrations and the turnout we've received thus far, we can safely say that a diverse knowledge community in South Asia and globally are keen, keenly interested in learning about and understanding the histories of anti-caste movements in the words and praxis of the members of the community. Thank you all for your interest. I also take the opportunity to thank all the speakers and moderators who have been so generous in sharing their knowledge with us. I've learned so much and I've been inspired by the works of artists, activists and scholars who have collaborated with us and presented their work here. A hearty thank go, thanks go to my movement sister, Dr. Rupali Bansuri, for coordinating this lecture series together with me. This lecture series is organized by Dalit Bahujan Adivasi Vimukt Women, Trans and Non-Binary Peoples Collective and South Asian Scholars and Activist Solidarity Europe in collaboration with Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung. We thank Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung for their generous support in organizing this yearly lecture series. My name is Swati Kamble. I'm a researcher activist. I've done my doctoral research on social movements in India, in particular Dalit women's activism and their influences on policy processes. Social movements and transnational solidarities have been my research interest, having been raised in a vibrant grassroots anti-caste Ambedkarite people's movement. Since this is the last session, I would like to take a few minutes to share with you all our intellectual and reflexive journey of crafting this lecture series. I elaborated this part when we introduced this lecture series. I'm retelling this journey for the benefit of the audience who might be joining us for the first time. I'll also briefly elaborate on our two collectives, which were formed to engage with the complex questions of solidarities among diverse anti-caste communities, the challenges they have encountered in achieving solidarities and future pathways. With this event series, we want to continue the critical conversations around caste and hopefully enable a platform for various Dalits and anti-caste voices and perspectives from South Asia and the diaspora. We also aim to build solidarity with other resistance movements, particularly of black, indigenous, ethnic minorities and people of color, Roma Sinti and marginalized migrants groups globally. Due to the virtual nature of this event, we have a diverse audience, some of whom are well aware of the inherent complexities within the anti-caste movement and scholarship, and others are new to the subject and may be here to know more. We will try to strike a balance during this session to bring to you knowledge emerging from anti-caste praxis in a way that is accessible. To the audience from privileged locations based in the Western world and those in the global South, I will urge you to conduct a reflexive exercise here of your own privileged social location and what it means to really listen to oppressed voices and witness their assertion. Our speakers who are writers, intellectuals and activists, activists are here to unsettle and dismantle the oppressive structures. They have put in hard labor to bring their reflections to us. So please bear that in mind when you ask questions. Ask the questions that will forward this conversation. Um, any form of hate speech and negative language won't be tolerated in this space. This is a safe space for our speakers and moderators, the members of anti-caste community and our allies. Our last year's lecture series focused on the complexities of Dalit identities intersectionalities of caste, class, gender, sexuality, and religion. It honored the work, works of contemporary Dalit scholars. Over these years, we as a community of scholars and activists are engaged in critically reflecting on highly contested nomenclature of Dalits. The concept to define anti-caste, um, caste oppressed groups have been debated and they've been continually evolving since the inception of the anti-caste movement. Without getting into the controversies, I'll present my reflections. Dalits are emancipatory subjects, a diverse group of people who share a long anti-caste movement legacy. 
This is an imagined collective identity. I call it imagined because it has been an impossible task to construct such a collective consciousness given the deep end casteism in the Indian society where even the so-called outcasts or ex-untouchables were divided into various castes and subcastes and were pushed to follow the rigid caste norms. As Ambedkar wrote in his famous essay on castes in India, some closed the doors and others found the, do the doors closed against them. Caste hierarchies operated when all involved locked themselves or were locked in their silos. The anti-caste revolutionaries whom we commemorate in the month of April, Jyoti Rao Phule, Savitri Mai Phule, Ambedkar and Periyar and other regional, local activists and many unsung four mothers have worked hard to bring the marginalized together. And yet the divisions are very prevalent. In the other context, Dalit literally means ground down, downtrodden, oppressed. Some of the historically oppressed caste communities exceedingly find the term Dalit imposed upon them, defined by their oppressed, oppressors. They have thus taken up terms such as Ambedkarites, the followers of Ambedkar as a self-defining identity. They've converted to other religions. Dalit, however, was also taken up as a subversive political identity, for example, the Dalit Panthers of the 1970s, who were influenced by the Black Civil Rights Movement and Black Panthers. They defined Dalits as all those who were caste, patriarchy, and class oppressed. Their manifesto read that members of scheduled castes and tribes, neo-Buddhists, the working people, the landless, the poor peasants, women, and all those who are being exploited politically, economically, and in the name of religion are Dalits. This an all-inclusive definition of uh, Dalit Panthers uh, was praised and contested. However, in a bid for being all-encompassing, this definition overlooked the caste, class, and gender inter intersectionality. We respect and acknowledge the Panthers' commitment to, annihilate, um, uh, to annihilation of caste and all forms of oppression uh, and for contributing so greatly to this dialectic that has gone on on the uh, in the anti caste communities this keeping in uh, keeping this in uh, this vibrant dialogue going and engaging with uh, it we decided to commemorate and celebrate the diverse anti caste histories in doing so we are also acknowledging the multiple solidarities that have existed in various anti caste movements the formerly untouchable castes who took upon the identity of dalits these uh, counter communities popularized Fule, Ambedkar, Periyar, and their ideologies. The Bahujans, or those who are believed uh, um, to be non Dvija masses, Adivasis, the indigenous communities, and Vimukta communities, those who are formally or, or inhumanly criminalized at birth. It is apt to celebrate these anti caste, anti hierarchical movements for social justice and equality, and the knowledge and art that is produced in these spaces. Now a brief about two collectives, um, uh, SASAS, South Asian Scholars and Adivasi Solidarity, is a self-organized group of activists, students and researchers in Germany and Europe. Anti-caste intersectional feminism and non-hierarchical autonomy are at the core of our collective. DBAV, Dalit, uh, DBAV Women, Trans and Non-Binary Peoples Collective, is an autonomous group of three generations of Dalit Bahujan, Adivasi, Vimukt, and trans and non-binary activist um, collective. As a group, we strive for horizontal and inclusive collaborations. Now coming to our today's session on how casteism shows up in the diaspora. One of Ambedkar's famous quote is that if Hindus migrate to other regions on, on earth, Indian caste would become a world problem. And in today's session, we will encounter how casteism made its way into other regions of the world, particularly in the US. As we would imagine with the long-standing anti-caste history that I just narrated, uh, wherever casteism shows up, we will have resistance movement to end caste and secure social justice. We will witness the anti-caste movement in the US diaspora speaking truth to power through this session. For this session, we have the honor to have Shrujana Sridhar as our moderator. Shrujana is an illustrator and artist based in Mumbai. She works on children's books and editor editorial illustrations. 
Her work centers on anti-caste expressions from an Ambedkarite and feminist perspective. Shrujana also runs the Dalit Panther Archive, which focuses on digitizing and translating little magazines and literature published by the members of the Dalit Panther, Panthers movement. Before I give the floor to Shrujana, a last note to the audience, kindly, kindly post your questions in the Q&A section and not in the chat. I welcome Shrujana now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Swati. Um... Jai Bheem, Jai Savitri. Uh, I'm Shrujana. I'm, art, I'm an artist and illustrator based in Mumbai. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this panel. It's an absolute honor to be here, listen, and to be able to participate in this conversation. Uh, I would like to start by introducing Manu. Uh, Manu Kaur is a Dalit queer non-binary community organizer and educator committed to dismantling casteism in the diaspora. They have been supporting national efforts to make caste a protected category in institutional anti-discrimination policies in the USA. Manu is deeply invested in Dalit futurisms and healing from cycles of trauma and uh, harm. They are called to do this work by their ancestors. Their work is rooted, rooted in advocacy and love for caste oppressed communities. Um, Manu? Uh, has uh, started sharing their slide. So I think that they can start their session. Thank you so much, Shruj, and I appreciate that intro. And thank you to Swati and Rupali and all the organizers. I'm really grateful to be here in this space with y'all. And I hope you learn a few things from me. Um, before I start, I want to say J Beam, J Savitri. Uh, my name is Manu. And um, I will be talking about how casteism shows up in the diaspora, specifically in the United States, but uh, which is also Turtle Island, um, but also um, all other parts of the world as well. Uh, before I get started, I do want to state that, you know, I'm always learning and I don't know everything and sometimes I might make mistakes. So please forgive me if I say something incorrect. I'm always learning. And also I wanna state that, you know, I'm speaking from privileges such as being in the Western world, being in a home, being with air conditioning and all that. So I just wanna list out that I'm speaking from that privileged um, standpoint and I don't speak for all Dalit people. This is um, a presentation that's made based on my own experiences and learning in this process. Um, I also work in a research lab um, and my research interests are on trauma. And so I'm very invested in um, studying how intergenerational trauma affects the body and the brain um, of folks throughout future generations. And so I am also very invested in um, Dalit futurisms and healing those intergenerational cycles of harm and violence. So many of you have probably seen this pyramid before, but I'm just bringing this up because for some people, this might be the first time that you're engaging in anti-caste uh, presentations and just learning about caste for the first time. And so caste apartheid is a structure of oppression that affects more than 1.9 billion people in the entire world. Um, and so caste is basically something that you are born into. It's something that you're assigned at birth based on whoever your parents are. And so there is this caste pyramid at the top are the Brahmins, which are known um, to be the most caste privileged. And then there's three other layers under that, the Kshatriyas, Vashyas, and the Shudras. Dalits um, actually are not even included in this pyramid. Um, we are considered outside of the caste and that's why we're formally known as untouchables because um, we're considered so impure that we're not even part of the caste system and so caste it basically determines how pure you are how close to you know god you are um, what you're allowed to do in terms of career who you're allowed to marry who you're allowed to hang out with who you're allowed to touch caste um it pretty much affects you know, all aspects of someone's life, how much money you can make, how much money you do make. Um, and so this is a system that, you know, it started in India, but now as folks have traveled overseas and across the world, it exists worldwide. 
These slides are also from Equality Labs. Um, so shout out to Equality Labs. So um, these statistics are from 2003. So it's going to be a little bit uh, you know, different now. But basically, back in 2003, there was about 2.5 million people of Indian descent that lived in the United States. Only 1.5% of those people were from Dalit and caste oppressed communities. So more than 90% were from caste privileged backgrounds. And I believe that's still reflective even now in 2022, the majority of South Asians or folks of Indian descent that you will meet in the United States, at least especially, are from caste privileged backgrounds, specifically from Brahmin um, backgrounds. And these are some statistics that came out a few years ago. Um, Equality Labs did a um, survey and a lot of um, caste privilege adversaries who are against this anti-caste work tend to say that, you know, this survey has been fabricated, that it's not valid. Um, and I just want to bring up that, you know, that's what folks with privilege who are, you know, at the risk of losing their privilege, that's what they do. They discredit any work that might show um, that, you know, their privilege is contributing to oppression. Um, so I'm just going to read a few of these that I found, you know, that are very important to kind of be aware of. Um, it says one in two of all Dalit respondents of this survey live in fear of their caste being outed. Um, so a lot of Dalit people do not disclose that they're Dalit. They will either, you know, lie about their caste or they will refuse to disclose their caste, but even refusing to disclose it in a way is a signal for a lot of folks um, that you know you are from a caste depressed background because many folks with caste privilege are taught to you know have pride in their caste and so really even though you know you try to hide your caste at the end of the day you're outed with or without your consent um, 60 percent of Dalit folks report experiencing caste-based derogatory jokes or comments and this can be derogatory jokes um, in the workplace at school at community events on social media um, i definitely am part of that 60 percent and one in three Dalit students report being discriminated against during their education and i want to remind you all that this is in the united states one out of three Dalit students um, I have definitely also experienced discrimination based on my caste um, in academia that I will go into um, later on. But basically, these statistics, you know, these sur the survey was conducted in the diaspora. These are reflective of di diasporic Dalits. And, you know, we want to kind of keep up to date on this survey. So I do believe that um, this is something that we should invest in and Dalit studies and Dalit research is something that we should absolutely invest in, particularly in the diaspora. So I did want to give some um, examples of caste-based discrimination that pretty much, you know, was on the news that kind of went viral when it happened. Um, before I start on that, I do want to give some trigger warnings that I will be talking about very specific casteist um, you know, behaviors and events that happened. And some of them include sexual violence, sexual trafficking, human trafficking. And so just be, you know, just letting folks know, especially our um, Bahujan community, just to um, take care of yourselves if any of this is triggering. Um, but basically, uh, one of the uh, events that I learned about a few years ago that really, you know, stuck out for me, it really did influence the trajectory of my own anti-caste um, activism was this um, story of this uh, Indian man named Lucky Reddy Bali Reddy. Um, so he was a Berkeley uh, landlord. So he came from India. Um, this his he's like greatly celebrated in India. And here he, he was kind of having a rags to riches story, which in itself is very interesting because a lot of caste privileged people, you know, they tend to like, when they come here, they'll say that they started from nothing and that they, you know, came with like $5 overseas and now they have like millions of dollars. Um, you know, it's kind of that American dream story that oftentimes we're told. And so that's kind of the light that was 
shine like that's what he was known as and so people were very proud of him um of course he came from a caste privileged background and basically between 1986 and 2001 he was um trafficking young girls young dalit girls from india so he was um basically sexually exploiting them bringing them here saying that they'll have a better life here instead of in india because you know they're they are caste depressed um and instead he was locking them up here and you know he was abusing them and um one of those dalit girls um ended up dying um from carbon monoxide poisoning because of the the living situations were so bad and it was because of her murder that um, he was finally caught for, um, you know, pretty much sex trafficking all of these Dalit girls. And, you know, he was extremely intentional about using Dalit girls because who cares about Dalit girls and Dalit women, you know, the, they are mo the most oppressed. And so he knew he had a lot of power and he knew that, you know, he could do this for years and years without being caught. Um, the only reason that he was caught was because he was literally caught trying to transport the body from one place to another. And, you know, there are buildings named after him. Um, even at UC Berkeley, he has had a lot of influence because of his money. He has donated a lot of things. That family still has a lot of power in Berkeley and in the Bay Area as a whole. But when I try to bring this up, a lot of people have never heard of this. And a lot of people have never heard of him or what had happened. You know, I live relatively near Berkeley and this was, you know, up until 2001, this was happening and I, did not hear about it until a few years ago, which just lets you know how privileged, um, wealthy, caste privileged people are. You know, a lot of his family members were able to kind of tuck this under the rug and not be affected by it. And, um, you know, those adult girls, like, we don't really know what happened to them. Most of them probably were sent back after that terrible, traumatizing event. And so that's, you know, one um example of sex trafficking that was caught you know i'd like to remind you that these are examples of um castus events that have been caught and so we don't know how many of them are still happening now that you know folks are not aware of um and also another form of casteism in the united states is also human trafficking a lot of a lot of dalit laborers dalit folks who um, are living in poverty in india are basically convinced to come here you know come to america and have a better life make more money and they're actually duped you know they come here and they're working in just the same or even worse living situations. Um, one of those examples was um, when Dalit laborers were forced to work um, to basically rebuild some, um, you know, caste privilege owned buildings during Hurricane Katrina. Um, and then the recent one that I wanted to bring up was it happened in New Jersey, and this was in 2021. This was literally last year. Um, they were raided because they were BAPS is a sect of um, Hinduism that they have, you know, BAPS temples all over the United States, very wealthy, very um, popular. And one of those BAPS temples in New Jersey um, was being built and the folks who were building it were Dalit laborers who were brought here and forced to work under terrible living situations, terrible work situations. They were only paid $1.20 per hour for years and years until, um, you know, eventually uh, they were able to kind of get this um, publicity and get help and get caught. The um, folks who are doing it. And it's just very telling that, you know, you can bring people out of South Asia, you can bring them out of India, but their mindset is still the same. They still see, you know, um, Dalit people as laborers, as people who need to, um, you know, live in these terrible work and living situations. And, you know, it's just very ironic and very cruel that um, these laborers are working to build these temples with their tear and their tears and sweats, and then they're not even allowed to enter the temples because of their untouchable caste, you know, that's been labeled to them. And so these are just a few of the examples. And again, this is, um, these are events that have been caught. And so it really just makes me wonder, 
how many of these similar situations are are happening right now as we speak, you know, that haven't been caught. And I think a huge part of why they haven't been caught is that a lot of folks don't know about caste. They don't know about casteism. They don't know what Dalit means. They don't know that not all brown South Asian people are the same or have the same privileges. Um, again, trigger warning, you know, um, this is just my lived experience. Um, I've personally experienced casteism. Um, on a very personal level, um, I'm, I'll share my story. So I was born in Punjab, um, Ludhiana. I came here when I was five years old. Um, you know, pretty much came here against my will. Um, my parents generally were trying to escape casteism in Punjab. And so they wanted to come here because they believed that that would lead um, to a better life for them and for me and their other children. Um, which led to a lot of attachment trauma that I won't get into right now. But um, my father was born into extreme poverty. Um, he has 10 to 11 siblings. A few of them did not make it because, you know, his family could not afford the medical health care that they needed. But he was able to um, afford education because of the reservation system. Um, the reservation system kind of, it provides seats for uh, caste depressed folks so that they have at least somewhat of an adjacent opportunity to pursue higher education. But even with the reservation systems help. He, his father, my grandfather, still had to work extremely hard. Um, you know, he was a farm laborer. He kind of took all kinds of jobs that other caste people would never do um, to be able to get the money so that my father could have an education. And he also, you know, was really um, good at school. And so because he was so exceptionally great at school, he was able to continue to access higher education and then eventually come here. Um, and his, you know, dream, his goal was to get his family out of poverty, um, which, you know, he slowly was able to do. Um, but that trauma, that casteism, you know, had on him since he was a child um, has led to a lot of um, cycles of trauma and harm and abuse in my family. And so, you know, this is the lived experience of many Dalit families is that there are a lot of, you know, high rates of addiction, domestic violence, abuse, um, because of that generational trauma. Um, and then when I came here, you know, um, I was able to adapt to American culture relatively easily after elementary school, just because I came here when I was younger. Um, and, you know, I knew things were off in my family because of all the trauma and I knew about caste as a child, um, but I didn't know of the details of how it was this entire oppressive system. I just thought caste was part of your culture that, you know, it's just traditional to marry, just like you have to marry the same culture, you should marry the same caste. That's kind of how I thought of it as. Um, and I also was taught to hide my caste. So my parents, my families, they couldn't even say Chamar. Um, Chamar is what our caste name is. And it's actually been used so much as a slur that I believe in India, you can actually um, get in legal trouble for using that if you're not from that caste. Um, but, you know, I just remember whispers of Chamar around my house and my parents and grandparents telling me not to tell anyone if anyone were to ask what caste are you to just tell them I am sick I am you know um, Punjabi but to never disclose my caste and so it was something that I was taught to hide and there was a lot of like shame around it but I never understood why and I didn't really go into it much because I just assumed that that was everyone's experience you know um, it wasn't until my teens and my 20s where I would see, you know, jut pride everywhere. And I was very aware of the fact that I was not jut, which is in Punjab, that's the dominant caste culture. Um, and then in my 20s, um, I started researching more about my family and like the generational trauma and the generational harm that existed. And because through my research of why there was so much trauma in my family, 
I was able to connect it to casteism. I was able to connect the dots that, oh, wow, like we're Chamar. Chamar is actually considered Dalit. And then Dalit actually were formerly known as untouchables. I remember learning about untouchables um, for like a quick second in seventh or eighth grade world history or something. And that was like the only time I really heard about it. And so in my 20s, finding out that I'm actually a part of that community, it was it was um, it was definitely a life changing event for me. I just remember realizing that things just made a lot more sense in terms of why things were the way they were in my family, why I didn't have any other family members here, why my family in Punjab was so poor and was so uneducated. And, you know, I always kind of had that shame of like, why can't my family be like so-and-so's family? They all have cousins here. They're all in school. They all have family reunions. Those things did not exist for me. And connecting the dots of how that was related to casteism has been a painful but healing experience for me, I would say. Um, and so on this slide, I have some examples of how I experienced casteism. Predominantly when I started talking about caste, you know, after really learning about it and doing research and healing, um, I started posting about it. I realized that no one was really talking about caste. Um, I didn't really know that many Dalit people. All I knew was the people around me were very caste privileged. And, you know, you can't rely on the privileged folks to talk about things that they are contributing oppression too. And so anytime I would talk about casteism, it was always usually in um, uh, around jut hegemony. And, you know, I experienced a lot of violent threats. I experienced a lot of bullying online. People would try to, you know, um, dox me. People would threaten me. People would accuse me of playing a victim, of just being an attention seeking person, not knowing what I'm talking about. You know, a lot of people would say that you know, caste is your culture or that jut means farmer or, you know, um, this has nothing to do with like oppression. It was just a lot of gaslighting, a lot of, you know, just there were like a lot of derogatory jokes made, things like, you know, saying I look like a Chamar, all of these things that you would think were left in the past, especially in India and Punjab. Um, I was still experiencing it now you know, this was only a few years ago. Um, and it just also was very sobering for me because these are threats that I'm experiencing on social media where, you know, I have some distance, it's not physical, but it also made me realize these are the types of threats that my father experienced growing up and trying to navigate a system that was not meant for him. You know, he disclosed that he experienced a lot of bullying, a lot of abuse from caste privileged kids and caste privileged people who did not want him there sitting next to them in school, sitting, um, reading the same books as them and having access to the same education as them. And so, you know, I can't compare my experience to him because I have that privilege, but the fact that I was receiving all of these terrible threats, it just made me realize how much he had endured because his threats were physical, you know, and it was a lot of physical violence that he endured. Um, and then I also experienced casteism, you know, in the dating world um, through friendships, um, especially through music and Pangra. I used to do Pangra growing up and, you know, I love dancing, but every song mentioned Jut Pride, every song, um, you know, had some sort of relation to casteism or alcoholism or toxic masculinity. And I just felt like I had to give it up. You know, it just was at a point too triggering for me to be in that culture. Um, it was too triggering for me to be around other cast privileged people that did not question the music or the lyrics, you know, that got to enjoy this huge part of our culture while I just, you know, kind of pretended that I was a part of that dominant culture. Um, and one of the reasons why I pretended was for survival. You know, I wanted to be included in these communities. And in order to be included, I had to um, basically pr pretend that I was caste privileged or also just like not disclose my caste. Um, and I am right now in the process of really trying to develop a different relationship to Pangara and dance in a way that has an anti-caste lens. I'm still figuring that out. I don't really know if it's possible because Bhangra music has been so intertwined with Jat hegemony that I don't know if it's possible, but you know, that's like one of the 
main ways that casteism shows up, especially in Punjabi culture, but you know, also in other cultures as well, there's this sense of like assumption that everyone here, especially in the diaspora, is caste privileged. Um, and you know, I'm here to show you that no, Dalit people exist. We are living here, and whether or not we're out, you know, we exist. Um, and so a more vulnerable and personal experience I wanted to share is that as I started getting more involved in anti-caste work, um, you know, I use my platform a lot to pretty much educate folks, but also call out, call in people who are um, spreading misinformation around casteism. And one of them was a queer um, Savarna girl who was posting misinformation around um, his around history around wearing a blouse and a sari um, and you know that that has a lot of pain for a lot of Dalit women and femmes and so I called her out on social media and you know um, in retaliation to that uh, she pretty much doxed me and she and someone who's part of an organization that is deeply against adding caste as a protected category both of them ended up doxing me and um, emailing my uh, supervisor and also email, emailing the dean of the institution that I work at. Um, and I'll give some of y'all some time to read. This is just a little part of the email that was sent. Um, but basically, you know, just even when you look at the words, like just saying, I was shocked to find out Manu was a member of staff at this university as their conduct online was extremely nasty, hateful, and crude. Um, they had bullied a creator they have never interacted with, calling her a castist bitch. I may have one or two regrets about saying names. I could have been more respectful about that. But also, you know, casteism is such a violent, violent thing to endure that, you know, sometimes nasty words need to be said. Um, but yeah, and so, you know, they basically labeled me as being Hindu phobic, deeply hateful, racist, queer phobic, femme phobic, you know, a lot of these identities that I clearly possess, I am a non binary queer femme. Um, and you know, I'm not Hindu, I'm, I was raised Sikh. And so casteism doesn't just exist in Hinduism, it exists in Sikhism, it exists you know, in other religions too, it's not just one faith that practices casteism. And so a lot of these accusations, you know, it was really just meant to get me fired pretty much, you know, the last sentence was, I leave it to you to decide what the best course of action is. Um, you know, I had called this person out for being casteist on social media. This person could have interacted with me on social media, could have left it there to have a discussion or whatever it was that they needed to move on from this but instead they came for my livelihood um, they came for my job the very job that I rely on to put food on my table to pay my rent to survive that's what they wanted to come for and that's kind of what I want to highlight is that a lot of caste privileged people have this mindset you know that you know, Dalit people and caste suppressed people, first of all, how could they even be at a, you know, prestigious university? And how can they, how dare they act this way? How dare, you know, they call someone out for being problematic? It's just the sense of um, superiority. And, you know, it, it was an extremely traumatizing um, process for me because, this email was sent to both my supervisor and the dean. Both of these people are white Americans. You know, they don't know anything about caste. Um, the dean read this and was just like, what is going on? Um, obviously, the way that the emails were sent, you know, you, you would be alarmed. You'd be like, who is this person? And so um, a thorough investigation was done on me by HR. And, you know, it was traumatizing because not only did I have to do the labor of explaining what casteism is 
and you know how this experience is doxing and how this experience itself is casteism i was also on the verge of thinking that i'm going to lose my job and you know that kind of position is it's deeply unsettling and traumatizing having to advocate for yourself and also having to out yourself as a Dalit, you know, I didn't want my supervisor and my dean and my institution to know my caste. That wasn't something that was done with my consent. I felt like I had to, I was forced to disclose it so that I could advocate for myself, when it, which is in itself violent. Forcing someone to disclose their caste is a very violent thing and caste is thing to do. And so luckily I was already part of anti-caste organizations that were able to vouch for me. I was already working with professors at my institution to add caste as a protected category. And so um, they were able to vouch for me. And eventually that situation was resolved. The Dean was able to you know, write me a letter saying that this was an experience of doxing and that I was doxed and seen as a target because of my anti-caste. Um, organizing. And so, you know, it had a happy ending, but at what cost? Um, it was a very sobering experience for me. And like I said, you know, I made some mistakes. I could have used gentler language. Um, but at the same time, you know, these folks came for my livelihood. You know, they came for the very thing I rely on to survive in this capitalistic society. And so that in itself is an experience of casteism. And what could have helped me was if I had an advocate at this institution who knew what caste was, who understood that even though me and this person accusing me of these things are both South Asian, we are not the same. Um, instead, I had to do that labor. And that in itself proves, you know, it shows that we need to add caste as a protected category, just like we're protected based on race, sexuality, gender, we need to be protected based on caste because whether folks want to believe it or not, Dalit people do exist in these higher institutionals, um, you know, colleges and um, businesses and tech world, we exist and we deserve to have these protections. And so that experience was, you know, it only motivated me to do this work further, but it also taught me to protect myself better. And so some folks, the first um, kind of introduction to CAS that they may have received was through Cisco, um, which is a tech company not that far from where I live. I reside um, in the same county that Cisco is, um, Silicon Valley. And, you know, this um, tech company um, employs a lot of South Asian folks, people of Indian descent, especially folks who come from India as well. And basically there was an employee who reported to Cisco HR that they were experiencing a lot of casteism, that they were, you know, having to deal with a lot of discrimination. They were not getting promotions. They were not, you know, getting the um, bonuses and the opportunities and the social inclusion that pe people of uh, uh, caste privileged backgrounds were getting. And, um, when they reported this to HR, there was retaliation and they were outed and experienced even more discrimination. And basically um, Cisco's uh, response to this was that, well, caste is not even a protected category. Caste is not even a thing that's protected in the anti-discrimination policies. So this lawsuit is not valid. And so that in itself really, kind of echoes this importance of needing to add caste as a protected category. I want to highlight that that's just the beginning, adding caste as a protected category. It does not all of a sudden abolish caste. It doesn't take away, you know, casteism. I mean, race is a protected category and we all are very well aware that racism still very much exists. And so this is just a baby step towards getting to caste abolition, which is why hopefully we'll are, we all are here, is to you know dream of an anti-caste um, world. And so the way that I got involved with caste protections campaign is by, you know, despite having to deal with a lot of bullying and a lot of, you know, threats online, I was also able to connect with amazing organizers and activists who were very anti-caste and who wanted to reach out and collaborate. And one of those people was Sahiba, um, who is an amazing, amazing anti-caste organizer um, and also Prem, um, 
is a Nepali Dalit organizer and activist as well. And both of them were working on this campaign and Equality Labs, which is a Dalit led organization. Um, you know, they were working to add caste as a protected category because there were just so many instances of casteism at the institution level. And so um, they were, uh, had some policies and written up some stuff. And in order to get it approved, we have to go through um, basically these hearings where you know you just chime in that whether or not you support something being added or not and so i just saw some you know uh announcements from sahiba that we that they really needed folks to show up they really needed caste privileged people to show up and you know state why caste needs to be added as a protected category and that's when like all of the dots started connecting in my mind of like, wow, this is important. We do need to add cast, um, you know, and I know that this is at the institutional level. And, you know, I do believe that grassroots anti-caste work is just as important, but, you know, we can do all of it. It doesn't need to be one or the other. And so I used my social media platform pretty much to boost, you know, this call for action. Um, you know, this was um, me asking all of the caste privileged people, um, organizers, all of the folks who wanted to be anti-caste, you know, who do a lot of other activism um, to show up for the people like myself and to, you know, um, basically add themselves to this hearing to prepare some, a, like a two minute, you know, in support of adding cast to the protected category. And it really, it spread, you know, a lot of folks started sharing these call for actions. And, um, you know, we were able to mobilize many people who did show up and who were committed. And now, you know, we are a cohort of people who have the same visions. And honestly, before that, mobilization experience, I felt very unsupported by caste privileged people. Um, many caste privileged people were just really ignorant, you know, um, it's a privilege to not know much about caste, because I knew about caste since the minute I was born. And so, you know, it's not enough to say, oh, well, I don't know about caste, I don't know my caste, therefore it doesn't exist. Very similar to say, saying I don't see color. Um, and so, you know, I think that call for action really woke some people up about just how violent the caste system is and how pervasive and insidious it is and how it still exists even in the United States. Um, and this cohort, these people showing up in these hearings and really, you know, being in support of Dalit people like me, that was the first time that I felt a sense of solidarity, a sense of intercaste, interfaith, solidarity, especially from other South Asian people. Um, before that, I always knew South Asian people to be very violent and discriminatory towards me and my family because of our caste. And in that moment, I felt this, you know, just like people showing up. It's an amazing feeling to see other organizers show up for you and, you know, show up for the issues that you care about. And, you know, um, sitting in those hearings was such a violent experience for me and other Dalit people. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the adversaries um, who are very caste privileged people were and still are extremely against um, adding caste as a protected category. Many of them also tried to organize themselves and show up to these hearings and just say the nastiest things, trying to scare um, the folks who were going to make the um, decision to add caste or not scare them into, you know, not adding this, saying things like this is Hindu phobic, this is racist, this is going to destroy the lives of their children who are caste privileged, um, and, you know, accusing um, us of just being um, problematic, accusing us of being terrorists, um, all these terrible things. And, you know, there was just one quote from this person who is very caste privileged and that one just stuck to me throughout this entire time of organizing um he said that caste is not a problem here when my toilet is broken i don't think to call a dalit to fix it i fix it myself you know that in itself should let you know 
what the mindset of caste privileged South Asian people is. They leave India and they come overseas, they come to these other countries and they still have the mindset that Dalit people are meant to clean toilets. But, you know, because casteism isn't this, you know, very organized system like it might be in India, they have to do it themselves. It still shows that their mindset is still the same. They just think that caste isn't a problem because they're not actually specifically, you know, hiring Dalits to do this dirty work for them. And, you know, it was a very violent experience hearing all of these things and knowing what these folks think of people like me, but it was also, you know, eye-opening to all of the folks who showed up in solidarity. Many of them were so shocked that people were saying things like this. Many of them, this was the first time they had witnessed something so direct and violent against the um, caste oppressed people. And for me, it was like, yeah, this, this is my lived experience. This is my parents' lived experience. This is actually not the worst of it. You know, we I've witnessed physical violence against my father for being Dalit. I've witnessed, you know, such derogatory language against them used all the time. And so I feel like this was the first time that other people were finally witnessing what the people experience, you know, on the regular. And so um, with all the hard work that everyone did, um, we were able to add CAST as a protected category um, across Cal State University system, which, you know, is the largest public university. Um, and so that was an amazing victory for us. And it was very encouraging because, you know, I think that finally institutions are starting to understand, you know, how violent the system is and how it's strategically been hidden. And now that folks are coming out and talking about it, you know, we can only go up. Like, we hope that this continues. You know, a lot of different organizations, such as the California Democratic Party, have added caste as a protected category. Um, this work is just starting. And so, you know, I want to give a shout out to the organizers who really started this and are um, basically, you know, our um, cohort is just getting bigger and bigger. And it's never too late to join in on this movement. Um, you know, I want to echo that this is just the beginning. And so, you know, you can contact me or other organizers if you want to get more directly involved. Um, you know, the dream and the goal is to add caste as a protected category, you know, worldwide, um, especially across institutions, workplaces, um, you know, places that the people really do need these protections. And so um, I've done a lot of talking. And as I mentioned, I don't want to speak for everyone when I talk about caste in the diaspora. Um, everyone has had a different experience of caste. Um, I also want to share that, you know, I live in the Western world. Um, when we first started to talk about wanting to add caste as a protected category and had this call for action to add caste and to have folks show up to these hearings, there were people like Dalit organizers in India um, and other parts of the world who are reaching out to me and asking how they could help, how they could support. And it, you know, like even though this was mainly like we were trying to just do this in California in the beginning, the fact that so many people in the world wanted to reach out and help and support and post about this, it was that's really like global solidarity. That's I remember just feeling this sense of empowerment, like, wow, you know, despite us being in such different parts of the world, we all do have this dream of an anti-caste world. And, you know, I felt just so much solidarity. And even though the ways that we organize here in the diaspora, especially, you know, on Turtle Island, this might function differently and it might look differently than the organizing that happens in other South Asian countries. Um, you know, despite our methods might be different, but our dreams and our visions are the same. And I think that's what unites us. That's what provides these global solidarities that I am so excited to continue to explore and build. 
Um, you know, I also have to check myself a lot too, that not everything that I do or believe here can be translated the same, you know, across the seas, especially in India. And so I have to kind of check that privilege at the door and also listen and learn and understand from those organizers there who have been doing this for a lot longer and who also know what works for them there that might not work here and vice versa. And so I have learned a lot throughout you know, my organizing experiences. Um, a lot of it is about humility. A lot of it is about being open to, you know, being called in and doing better. And I'm continuously learning and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also uh, wanted to share these folks. These are just some um, of the folks who are willing to kind of share how they have witnessed um, casteism in the diaspora. Um, I want to read uh, one of the folks um, said um, some of them have listed out their cast. Um, all of these folks are cast privileged and they're all based in either, you know, um, Canada, the UK, um, the United States, um, just all over the diaspora. Um, one of them stated, I did not know I was from a privileged caste until I was 30 years old. As a caste privileged Punjabi Sikh, I did not realize the Baps temple I visited was built by exploited Dalit labor. My surrounding community in the diaspora never spoke of caste, which taught me that caste does not matter over here. Ignorance in someone as privileged as I am is as dangerous as um, is as dangerous tool that upholds oppression. This awakening is a call to action for all caste privileged folks to abolish caste practices and uplift Dalit, Bahujan, and Adivasi voices. I just like reading that, I felt so empowered that, you know, folks of caste privilege are showing up in that way. I think that's so beautiful. And it goes against this idea that, you know, all caste privileged people are just these terrible people who don't care to unlearn or who don't care about the issues. This is the solidarity that I'm talking about. This is, you know, the movement that I am so grateful to be a part of. Um, and so I appreciate all of these folks. Um, I will be posting these pictures across social media with the permission of these folks, of course. And so if you're not able to read all of them now, I encourage you to read them later. And I also um, asked a lot of um, caste suppressed, specifically Dalit folks, if they felt comfortable sharing how casteism showed up for them in the diaspora. One thing I do want to highlight um, that some of you may have noticed is that a lot of Dalit caste suppressed people who agreed to be part of this presentation, who, who agreed to write, many of them are covering their faces. Many of them don't feel comfortable disclosing their identity. And I think that really speaks to the stigma and to the fear it, that there still is, um, you know, of being Dalit. You know, many folks still can't have the safety and, you know, the privilege to be out about their caste because of the violence, because of the casteism. And these are folks in the diaspora, you know, this is, um, I think in itself very evident that this is a very violent system of oppression that very much still exists. Um, I wanted to read a few of these. Um, these will also be posted um, with, of course, the consent of these folks that have shared. But I wanted to read one of them. I know that it's kind of hard to read. Some of them might be blurry, but one um, cast oppressed person wrote, casteism shows up in my life as online harassment, being called casteist slurs and being asked to clean toilets. It has also affected my love life as my partner's family has rejected me due to their caste and my caste location. They have cut all ties with us. And so a lot of times, you know, um, when folks get into inner caste relationships, um, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of rejection, there's a lot of, um, you know, just um, people being disowned for marrying outside of their caste. And this is still happening in 2022. Um, and so, you know, casteism in the diaspora shows up in a lot of ways. And you know, some of these ways um, I also personally experience, the people I love personally experience. And so, you know, I just wanted to share the voices of other folks because I really don't want to speak for everyone. Everyone's experience with caste has been different. And so these are just a few of the glimpses of how it shows up for people in the diaspora. 
Um, and so I wanted to share, you know, how casteism shows up for me. And so casteism shows up for me in the diaspora when I try to connect with South Asian queers, but caste power dynamics become a dividing factor. I feel too queer and non-binary for the Dalit community, but too Dalit for the South Asian queer diaspora. I crave connection and safety, but where do I find it? Where are the queer Dalit safe spaces? And, you know, that's really been my experience is that I've experienced a lot of casteism coming directly from South Asian queer people, people that I really want to connect with because of that cultural experience, um, shared experience. But, you know, caste, unfortunately, tends to divide me from a lot of those community members. Um, and so I do a lot of these talks and presentations, um, obviously, to educate folks, but I mainly do them to find my community to find other Dalit queer people who might be listening to this presentation or who might come across my profile. Um, you know, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I really crave that connection and that solidarity. And, you know, I won't, of course, I will respect your desire to not be out for whether being queer or Dalit or both. But, you know, I encourage you to reach out to me. I am looking for that community and I am sure that you are too. And so I have my socials on here. I also have um, Instagram for Quality Labs and also um, our amazing moderator. Um, one last thing that I wanted to state was, um, it's a very violent experience for a Dalit person to think that they're speaking to someone who might also be Dalit or caste oppressed based on, you know, how that person's social media or image or aesthetic is, and then find out that they're actually Saverna, aka caste privileged. And so I really encourage folks who are, you know, uh, very caste privileged from both sides um, to just kind of disclose your caste positionality on your socials and in your bios and in your introductions if you are in an anti-caste space. Um, just to be transparent about your caste positionality, there's no need to be ashamed of the privilege you hold. I just ask that you be transparent about it and you use that privilege to make a difference. Um, so that's pretty much all that I have right now. Thank you everyone for showing up, for showing up in solidarity, for listening. I hope that you got at least one thing out of this presentation. Thank you to Swati and Rupali and Trujana for being here and supporting me through this process and for doing an amazing job on these lecture series that I'm so humbled and grateful to be a part of. Um, Jay Beam and Jay Sabatri, thank you. Thank you so much, Manu. That was such a brilliant lecture. I was completely gripped throughout and um, I have so many questions. Um, but should we, uh, should I uh, start with a few questions first or should we wait for something from the audience? I think, I think I'll just start with questions. Um, so my first question is what has in all since you shared so much about the organizing you guys have been doing within the community there uh i wanted to know what the reaction and anxieties of savarna folks in the south asian diaspora has been in response to like rising anti-caste assertion and in what ways are they uh expressing these anxieties yeah, I mean, you know, it's been mixed responses. Um, I do think that a lot of Savarna folks, caste privileged people who, you know, are already, you know, um, have kind of left politics um, or want to be part of the anti-caste world are very open to learning. And, you know, even though they, since casteism is something that's so ingrained in them, they will, um, you know, end up you know, being casteist, but as long as they're willing to learn, um, they've been supportive and, you know, they've shown up, but, you know, there has been a lot of people who are also just, they're not about it. They don't want to hear about it. They're in denial about it. They want to gaslight. They want to, you know, they're actually, they're terrified of losing that privilege. And so they react in very violent ways, such as doxing people who are very outspoken about these issues. Um, you know, um, they want caste to disappear. 
you know, they want to disappear the privileges and the wealth hoarding that they have achieved through the exploitation of Dalit people back home, because it's very easy for them to come here and say, I'm brown, I experienced racism, I am not privileged, you know, um, but it's more difficult for them to acknowledge that even though they are brown here and experience racism, they are also very, very caste privileged and are also oppressors. And I think that that can be a very uncomfortable duality to sit with. And so that a lot of that results in, you know, this like violent retaliation and, you know, showing up to do anti-protests or, you know, showing up to these hearings and just saying the most castist ridiculous things that they could think of, but saying, oh, caste is not an issue. Um, some of them have compared adding caste as a protected category to, you know, um, people having to like uh, write it on their arms and like show it. Some of them have compared it to um, Holocaust uh, survivors and victims. And it's just, it's been pretty, pretty terrible, honestly. Thank you so much for answering that. And um, the, I have a few more questions, but first we'd like to take some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, the first question is, uh, they're saying, thank you for your activism and all you are doing to change the world, Manu. On a more personal note, uh, how do you take care of yourself and manage all the pain this work brings you? Um, I, I really appreciate whoever said this. Um, thank you for asking that. I think oftentimes organizers and people who talk about really difficult, painful issues tend to forget to take care of themselves and tend to burn out. Um, the ways that I take care of myself are lots of therapy. <laughs> um, I feel very blessed um, that I have access to therapy. I have access to healing that, you know, my parents and my you know, ancestors did not have access to, you know, they were in survival mode for their lives. And the fact that I have this privilege to heal these like generate intergenerational wounds. Um, I do genuinely believe that my ancestors are guiding me to do this work and that me healing and doing this work is also healing for them. I don't feel like I can even take credit for a lot of the work that I do. I feel like, you know, I am being guided by um, some of the things that I really like spiritually believe in. And so that kind of grounds me when I get overwhelmed or when it's too much. And I also, you know, I take breaks. Like when I was doxxed, I just kind of took a huge back step. I kind of had to, um, to really just take care of myself and my mental health and my mental well being because eventually these like threats and online bullying and you know, experiencing it is very violent. And so I'm in a lot of somatic therapy. I'm, you know, in a lot of um, kind of uh, classes learning how to regulate my nervous system because I often function sometimes from a triggered state. And I think that a lot of Dalit caste oppressed people do is that, you know, we're born into these very triggered nervous systems. And so learning to regulate them and settle them is a part of the healing work. And so I feel deeply invested in my own healing in that way. Thanks for asking that. That's a really important question too, because that that is something that organizers go through throughout and everywhere. And I also feel like our therapy should be paid as reparations. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, <laughs> I did. I had like a little, I think, GoFundMe or whatever. I was like, you know what? Just Venmo me because therapy is not cheap, y'all. It is not cheap. <laughs> um, another question that has come in is around acad academia. Uh, the question is, that there's no doubt that most of the Indian students in academia are from dominant caste backgrounds. How would you like to see universities, faculty, staff, and students go about increasing representation of Belgian students in the US? Yeah, I mean, you know, like 
the folks here in academia that are doing this anti-caste work are all from caste privileged backgrounds because who gets access to these higher educational systems, right? It's Savarnas, it's people with caste privilege. Um, the, even in that email that I was doxed in, this person was so shocked that a Dalit person could exist in higher education, you know? And so I think that adding caste as objective category is literally a baby step towards that direction. And then, you know, really just um, basically admitting Dalit students to do Dalit studies research, you know? Um, I don't think that caste privileged people should be doing research um, around Dalit studies. They should be doing research on why caste oppressed people uh, do oppression, <laughs> you know, focus on Savarnas, don't focus on us, let us do that work, you know, make room for Dalit um, academics, you know, um, uh, accept them into your programs, um, you know, like let them do presentations and conferences and give them the mentors that they need to thrive in these spaces, you know, um, for example, like for me, like um, my father, yes, he went to school there and he got higher education, you know, but I am the first one in my entire family who is going to pursue a degree higher. I'm going to be the first doctor in my family. And to me, that's such a big deal, but it has been the most difficult journey for me because, you know, I don't have anyone in my family to kind of help guide me or um, mentor me through that. And so it's been, um, you know, it's just been a lot of myself advocating and looking for mentors and looking for people who can support me in higher education. And so that's what Dalit people need, you know, we need mentors, we need resources, we need those connections that Savarna people just have because of their privileges. Yeah, uh, there are more questions to do with um, sort of just entering abroad or just coming and newly joining the diaspora, I think. One of them is that uh, this person says, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. In my university in the Netherlands, there is no current anti-caste dialogue. A lot of political consciousness in this country is far behind from what it should be. As a Savarna person who has recently begun really engaging with anti-caste activism and work, I do not want to be the person and voice being centered in such a movement. Is there any, adv any advice on how to navigate this all the power to you, Manu. Um, thank you. I really appreciate you for um, being aware of your privilege and the space that you're taking up and not wanting to take up. I think that in itself is really important. Um, I absolutely think that Dalit people should be at the forefront of these movements. And, you know, again, but we also have to remember that a lot of people, you know, because of the violence, because of you know, the stigma are not even able to be out um, about their caste, about their caste oppression. And so it's really tricky. Um, but, you know, if there isn't any work that's being done, I would encourage you to start that. I would encourage you to create a movement, create a cohort, create, you know, dialogue so that you can create a space that is welcoming and relatively safe so that the people can come and join that. But I do think that you should start it because that's better than nothing. That's better than nothing happening about it. Um, the next question is similar, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, okay, so they say that, um, thank you for sharing your experience, Manu. As the Dalit from India, I always thought I could escape casteism abroad. Listening to you has enlightened me and has also given me hope for a better future. My question is that, will things get better for the Dalit community, especially the queer community, queer Dalit community? Um, I'm glad that, you know, I'm able to kind of highlight that just because we leave South Asia, just because we leave India, that, you know, we don't just leave casteism behind. You know, I'm sure that my father thought that things would be different here and they weren't. And so that's something that I think is so important for the adult community to know before they travel overseas, because, you know, that was the experience that many caste oppressed people have had when they leave 
that violent system only to re-experience it here. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that the fact that I'm doing this work, the fact that, you know, we're organizing in anti-caste circles, I think shows that I absolutely do think that things are going to get better for the Dalit community. I do think things are going to get better for the Dalit queer community. You know, that's what these queer Dalit futurisms are all about is that I do envision a world that, you know, is um, anti-caste, you know, and doesn't, you know, have these like violent systems upheld. Um, you know, I hope that I can experience it in, you know, my future. Um, but I do believe that as more and more people care about this, as more and more people talk about this, as we build these solidarities across the world, um, and as we build it with other movements, you know, such as Black Lives Matter, um, such as Indigenous folks, as we all, you know, invest in each other's liberation, I do envision a better, more just world. Otherwise, I don't think I'd be doing this work. <laughs> I'd be sitting at home. I am at home, but you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 and speaking of like futures someone has asked what are some of the dreams you envision for Dalit queer futures um yeah I, I think like you know it's like a really powerful question and that's something that I like I want to ask to other cast oppressed people too because you know we all have different visions and different you know what we consider um liberation but I mean the basic bare minimum is that people you know are born with you know the same access to resources the same access to wealth the same access to things that they need to achieve their own unique dreams um you know a world where you know violence and oppression and capitalism and you know racism sexism transphobia homophobia like all these things you know they're not like they don't exist in the ways that they exist now and that if they ever do more people are against it and are willing to abolish it than not um i just you know i just really see a world where people are born into it knowing how worthy they are and knowing you know how much love they have and how much love they receive um i think one of the main things with Dalit people is that we're born, you know, being taught that we're worthless, that we're um, something about us is contaminated and something is impure and that we're dirty. And, you know, I that really messes up your sense of self and your self-esteem and your love for yourself. And so I really envision a world where everyone knows that their existence is so important. that's really powerful and and it has so much to do with um how we can continue assertions and keep resisting and it really also like ties in with your work around healing as well um and uh so another question is one second this is how huh. how can we carefully navigate moments regeneratively when other BIPOC use their marginalized identities to not own their casteism, homophobia, ableism, transphobia. What has worked for you in terms of navigating this? Yeah, um, you know, I think um, a lot of concepts of transformative justice have really helped me a lot. Um, you know, I realized how much of my unlearning around punitive measures and call out culture and cancel culture have been ingrained in me. And a lot of that I'm still unlearning, but basically there's this idea that all of us um, have the capability of being harmed and all of us have the capability of doing harm and that we all have privileges and we all are oppressed. And so there's this duality of like, no one is gonna be the most most like, you know, oppressed person there is, like compared to someone, we always have some sort of privileges. And so I think when someone says, well, I am, you know, a person of color, how can I cause X, Y, Z? It's important to 
mentioned that duality that just because you're a person of color doesn't mean that you can't be anti-Black, doesn't mean that you can't be anti-Indigenous, doesn't mean that you can't be anti-Dalit. Um, you know, and just because you're a Dalit doesn't mean you can't be homophobic or transphobic or anti-Black. Um, I feel like sometimes I do see anti-Blackness even within Dalit communities and that in itself functions differently even overseas versus here on Turtle Island. And so it's like a very complex um, navigation of like your identities and the context that you're in. And, you know, I have to like check myself a lot and even get checked by other people about my own privileges and like, you know, how even though I am oppressed in these ways, I also still am very privileged in a lot of other ways. And so I have to also, you know, kind of go back and like listen and learn and, you know, not take up that space. Thank you so much for answering that. And that's a really tough one too, because it's not just over there, even over here, we have to sort of like, there are many nuances and many different communities um, and, and that these identities are not homogenous and, it, uh, and it's important to sort of recognize those differences too. Um, so uh, another question is, are woke South Asian spaces in the diaspora particularly more casteist? This tends to happen here a lot. Um, uh, particularly more casteist in comparison to exactly what I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, I think that, you know, I, I have experienced actually the most amount of casteism personally from queer caste privileged people who are out there fighting for, you know, all these different movements, um, you know, like, they're out there on the streets protesting for like Black Lives Matter, which is amazing, beautiful, so necessary. But then they come home to like very castist family members and they don't do anything about it. You know, there are so many uh, caste privileged queer people who are uh, woke. I don't, you know, I feel like that term has been co-opted and stolen from the Black community, but you know, like they, they, they just never post about anti-cast stuff on their page they never openly support the Dalit people they'll send me messages saying like you're doing such important work I'm so proud of you but then like when it comes to like them doing the work there's silence and I think that silence is castist that silence is cowardly you know like I understand that a lot of Savarna's may experience backlash or even being disowned for talking about casteism because of how casteist their families are. But, you know, I get doxxed for it. And so if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you were, you were talking a lot about Looks like we've lost Shrujana for a bit. <laughs> Let's wait for a second. Yeah. Mercury retrograde's coming, y'all. Be safe. Hello? Hi. Hello? Can you hear us? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Hello? Hello? We can hear you, Shrujana. Okay, okay, I can finally hear you. Recording in progress. Yeah. Um, so basically, what I, I was talking about, the sort of solidarity that you found with uh, Prem and Sahiba and what finding community meant for you. And I was just wondering if you were able to find solidarities like that outside of the South Asian communities marginalized by caste? I mean, um, finding community for me was everything. I genuinely don't think I would be here doing this work if I didn't feel supported. You know, like I said, even though I experienced a lot of like bullying and threats, uh, me being outspoken on social media has led me to meeting such amazing organizers, amazing people, amazing mentors 
who, you know, I now consider family and, you know, that has been so powerful and encouraging for me. I feel very loved and supported. Um, and yeah, you know, I, it's funny that you, the second part of the question, um, I feel like, like people who are not South Asian have shown up for me and have, you know, shown up to learn about caste and casteism more than South Asian people. Um, like a lot of my friends who are like black activists and organizers, they're like there for me. And they're like, thank you for educating me on caste. Like they're engaging with me. They're showing up to these hearings, people of, you know, who are not um, South Asian, um, you know, so many of them have actually witnessed what they now realize was casteism, but they just didn't understand it. And so, um, like that solidarity has been, you know, gives me chills sometimes just to see how oppression is just like rooted in so much violence and how, even though we can't compare these systems of oppression, they're so parallel. And sometimes like, you know, I feel like caste privileged South Asians don't get it in the way that other oppressed communities such as especially the black queer community and indigenous communities understand it because they've been through that violence and oppression and are still going through it. Yeah, and it and that and finding that community is also such a big part of healing and being able to also feel like globally connected to more people. Um, <laughs> Oh shit. Uh, so, one second. I'm just looking for the next question. Okay. Um, so, this question is sort of trying to connect um, efforts being made in the diaspora in US and India. They're saying, Jai Bheem, Jai Savitri. Thank you so much for this informational session on how casteism shows up in the diaspora. You've mentioned that you're doing research along with your organizing work. I wanted to ask how we can bridge efforts in India, in academia especially, and in the US academia, in terms of what literature, Dalit literature and research is approved and published and studied upon. Yeah, um, so I, I should mention that the research I do is um, not necessarily um, related to like Dalit um, studies or even uh, social sciences. It's um, more in um, STEM. It's, it's kind of separate from the organizing work I do in the sense that that's my job and that is what I'm using to pursue graduate school, whether it's a PhD um, in clinical neuropsychology or whether it's medical school. Um, you know, I am very interested in um, trauma and in how trauma specifically affects the neural circuits and functioning in adulthood um, and also how it also affects, you know, the body um, and the neurobiology um, of people who come from very, very, you know, marginalized communities. Um, but, you know, that's also directly related to my organizing work because, that trauma comes from these systems of oppression. Um, but again, it doesn't leave me a lot of work to, I mean, a lot of opportunity to kind of bridge that gap between my organizing and my professional research. Um, but in terms of the literature um, and bridging that between, you know, the diaspora, diasporic research and research that's happening in India, um, I think that there's so much opportunity for that collaborative work to be happening. And I think like conferences, um, doing workshops, connecting people, having networking events, um, having these like academic paper collaborations, uh, research studies. Um, this is all so, so imperative. One of the themes that I noticed in the hearings was just how much caste privileged people were trying to dismiss um, how empirical the research was that was being cited around um, how, you know, how many Dalit people experience casteism. They all like were so hyper-focused on discrediting a lot of the surveys and a lot of 
the research that was cited. And a lot of that has to do with them wanting to discredit the fact that the researchers are actual researchers, that we are academics, you know? Um, caste privileged people have a lot of access to higher education and, you know, they have all these degrees and they have like uncles and aunties with these degrees. And so one of the main ways that they practice casteism also is to discredit the work that Dalit people do simply because we're Dalit. Um, and so I think um, there needs to be an investment in Dalit research, um, in funding those studies and funding, you know, um, whatever resources um, there needs to be to publish and to publish it in journals and, you know, um, have it be this like empirical, scientific, you know, whatever academic jargon you want to use. I feel like I try my best to not really organized in academic spaces only because I don't think they're accessible. I prefer to kind of use like social media or something that most people have access to. Um, just because I just feel like if the work I'm doing is not accessible, if my mom can't understand what I'm doing, then I just don't feel like it's making it the type of impact I want it to make. That was a long winded answer. Um, I, I think there needs to be more collaboration. And I think like a conference or a networking event could be one of the ways to introduce folks to each other who wanna do similar research in the diaspora and in India. Hello. So um, that was that, and a networking, even if it could be like, even this kind of efforts are really helping this platform also really helps in sort of creating those connections and networks. Um, um, the next question I wanted to ask is at a more personal level, um, I wanted to ask how dating has been for you as a queer Dalit person. I also want to mention that this will be the final question for our session because we've run out of time. There are many, many more questions. So I think that we can figure a way to sort of have those answered in some other way. But we're running out of time right now. So this will be the final question. And yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. Um, dating for me, um, I would say like um, my experiences with, you know, I really crave um, that cultural connection with someone. And so, you know, I would love to be able to date and have a life partner who is South Asian, um, queer, obviously, but, you know, my past few experiences of dating caste privileged South Asians, um, caste has just been this, like, you know, elephant in the room. Um, it's just, it's, it's so hard to explain. And even when I'm trying to explain it to the person that I'm experiencing casteism and they're not able to see it, it kind of just lets me know like cast power dynamics will always exist between me and someone that is caste privileged, no matter what, especially if I'm dating them. And so I feel like I feel like my ancestors are kind of like trying to protect me from dating Savarnas at this point because of my experiences. They've just been so, you know, like I've dated like uh, South Asian queers who come from very caste as family members. I've dated those who just don't know a lot about it. And I've dated someone who actually was very, who's been involved in the anti-caste spaces. And still like throughout, throughout dating Savarnas for me has just been, like a very violent experience. And so I think that I'm just learning that as a Dalit queer person, I just don't feel safe or, you know, supported in those types of dating relationships. And so I do believe that I um, can't really date um, Savarna queers. And, but, you know, it just makes dating hard because I don't really know any queer Dalit people um, and so, you know, dating, I think, is one of those things in um, these spaces that a lot of Dalit people just, you know, casteism just really ruins um, dating people of similar cultures because caste is always that dividing factor. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah.
uh, sharing that because it takes a lot of like it takes a lot to be that vulnerable and open yourself up in a space like this so thank you so much for doing that and uh, again we're really sorry uh, we cannot take more questions um, and I think that with that uh, we'll end this session and uh, I, and it was truly such a fascinating session for me and I have like 10 more questions that I've just written down so I feel like I just want to have uh, be able to attend another such lecture by you so um, I, I really look forward to uh, <laughs> hearing you more uh, so now I'll just pass it on to Swati and Swati can take it from here Thank you so much, Rujana. Um, really, uh, apologies to such an interesting, thought-provoking questions that have come in. Um, but we definitely, like Rujana said, will have uh, next opportunity, many more opportunities to connect with and uh, speak with uh, Manu. It's been such an enlightening, enriching experience for us all. Thank you, Rujana and Manu, for uh, you know uh, this. Uh, enlightening experience indeed um thank you for uh, joining us everybody and sticking here till the last moment this is the end of our series and thank you my uh, colleagues here rupali and again the speakers and moderators um, who have been so generous all along and everybody that has attended uh, who registered who've shown interest who have reached out to us uh, uh, we'll be continuing this work and we would love your feedbacks. We would love uh, your questions and comments. So do reach out to us on Sasa's email that is shared in the chat box and also the DBAV Collective's email. Uh, with this, we are concluding this lecture series and this evening. Enjoy uh, your evenings. Bye-bye.